So we're going to talk about intermittent fasting. You know, we started with the genesis of health. We talked about gut health. We talked about oral health. We've talked about various labs. Um, we talked about my preferred dietary style, which I never follow, which we had a couple times ago, talking about how to just put more vegetables on your plate and less protein and less fats. And I think it's um, <clears throat> one of these days I'm going to talk about how you measure what you really should have in terms of never enough nutrients, but in terms of carbs, proteins, fats, based on you know your A1C, your fasting insulin, your activity, things of that nature, really would dictate well. What Tom, can you, I can I make a comment to you? No. <laughs> so so the comment that I'm gonna I'm gonna make there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal in regards. To well, some research that shows that it's developed a taste literally within the, the first six months. And some of that taste when it comes to food is probably even developed in utero. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, is, which is really fascinating from a standpoint of the fact that, you know, as we have become a more obese society, um, certainly we can understand that some of those influences are occurring very, very, very early. It's not necessarily just at the table. Well, it's, it's becoming clear to me, and that it, took, it took a long time to realize that getting, getting the culture truly out of diabetes, for example, is going to take two generations. Um, it's, it's, not an, it's not an easy task. And, you know, some people can get out of it fairly quickly, but from a generational perspective, it's going to take that long. And, you know, you know um, Richard, Dr. Trump and I wrote that paper about predisposition to Alzheimer's starting at pre-birth. I mean, I don't like people to think that that's a death sentence, that, that they're on that path and they can't avoid it. There are modifiable risk factors, but it's gonna, it takes effort. What's the slogan I saw the other day that I really like? We, we presented to Adrian and Roland, Dr. Carter. It was, um, the, you know, the effort of discipline will always outstrip the effort of regret. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, or the the work to to create the discipline. So we're going to talk about intermittent fasting today, and I think it's a pretty vanilla topic. I mean, it's like skip some meals, right? But I think it's um, what I want to cover today. We're not going to go into a diet plan today, or talk about you know the sixteen eight or anything like that. That'll be next time or another time. I uh, will. I'm going to talk about it more from a historical perspective and give you some tools to ponder. Because like, you know, the, the question I always do in my, my ministry programs is, where did you learn that? So we're going to cover kind of like, where did you learn that? And it's ingrained in our being now, just like Richard was saying about obesity, it's becoming ingrained in the parents passing the, the genes on to the children and so on and so forth. So, you know, in order to, to solve big problems like that, it, it, can, it can never be just the what. You know, what? Intermittent fast. Why? Why? And what is the historical basis behind it, for example, that might give us some insight into that why? So that's what I'm going to cover today. So what is intermittent fasting? We'll cover that very, very generally. And it's simply time-restricted feeding. It's an eating pattern where you cycle between periods of eating and fasting. You know, one could argue if you eat three meals a day, you're intermittent fasting because there's periods of time between which you're not eating. Um, but really, it's, it's looking at um, delaying the periods beyond the classic accepted societal uh, intervals for consuming uh, fuel and, and uh, nutrients at this point. There are several different intermittent fasting methods, all of which split the day or week into eating periods and fasting periods. So that's the basic de definition. Um, let me get Dr. Carter to comment on this because most guides, you know, you've got the legal team behind it saying, you know, the do's and don'ts, and the, and the, and the don'ts, in my opinion, tend to be more conservative. Pregnant women, I agree with that. Newborns, I agree with that. Um, let's see. Small children, makes sense, I guess. 
High performance athletes, I don't agree with that. Eating disorders, I think it could be very helpful, particularly if they understand the why. And then type 1 diabetes. A type 1 diabetic is taking insulin. I mean, they're no different than you and me. Dr. Carter, any comment on... on um, well, I mean, the, the high performance athletes, because they, they need so much fuel, it, it just really depends on, you know, their you know, basal metabolic rate and how much they're burning through everything. Because the potentially if you do a significant intermittent fast, which is, you know, you know, mainly just one meal a day, then that could potentially prove to be problematic in terms of their performance. So, um, and what the last category was, um, type one diabetes, so, eating disorders, yeah. type one diabetes. Yeah. So with type one, yeah, definitely. Um, that, that would need to be very, very carefully moderated, you know, um, on a continuous basis, um, by a physician. So that with type one, uh, since, since, um, you know, the glucose and insulin, values can be so uh, erratic, um, that would be something that you have to be really, really careful about. But not impossible. Not impossible, but not something that you would really kind of start with. Got it. Okay. Fair enough. And what about people with eating disorders? Um, again, yeah, you want to, because they have all these cravings, they, the better way, obviously, is to um, address the cravings with if they have neurotransmitter imbalances, you know, uh, serotonin and, and, and so forth. And, but also because, you know, a lot of eating disorders have morphed because of the food supply that we're eating, like gluten. And gluten has what are called gluteomorphones which is just how it sounds like, you know, morphine can stimulate the opioid receptors in the brain and uh, stimulate pleasure centers. Um, gluten can have that same effect. Same thing for uh, milk. They're called caseomorphones. So again, the food supply has, you know, really caused a huge conundrum, you know, even just beyond leaky gut and all that stuff, but has a lot to do with, uh, uh, cravings and uh, and eating disorders. Yep. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, the, the thing we always discuss is nutrient density. And if you're skipping meals, we, we, all of us have a source of excess calories. We store fat and we have an excess, we have a, a storage for iron called ferritin. And we have a storage for minerals called, uh, bones and we have a storage for protein called muscle so there is, are these storage systems and so it's just a question of what kind of equilibrium you want to set up do you have an excess of anything and if you do then you can use that excess so for example with fat people can use the excess fat to uh, substitute for calories but most people with excess fat are actually nutrient deficient so that's going to potentially rob from their bones. So that's not, a good, that's not a good deal. And that's why a lot of people that are doing fasting long-term, the studies, they're, they're taking in, uh, obviously, water with uh, minerals and vitamins and things of that nature. But anyway, fasting has a long history. So Plato says, I fast for greater physical and mental efficacy. And humans have been fasting since the beginning of time. Why would he have better mental efficacy and, and physical efficacy. I think digestion is probably underappreciated as being a very energy intensive process. So, you know, that's why athletes don't, you know, they eat well before the event. So they're done di the major portion of digestion and can direct that energy to the athletic performance. You're never going to eat on a full stomach. Why? Because you're full but probably the primary reason is you're putting a lot of resources into digestion. It's very energy intensive. 
And the brain, being extraordinarily metabolically active, will benefit from not competing for that energy with digestion. Um, and once again, Dr. Carter, anytime you want to chime in, please do. Um, the gospel and the disciple of, of fasting, there are 77 biblical references to fasting. Okay, the Quran mentions it, the quote I found is, no more than 13 times, but so fasting has been an integral part of, you know, uh, religion. Culture or science. Consider how hard it is to go against the grain. You know, it, it, it wasn't too long ago. I wish it was a lot longer ago than it was, but probably about 10 years ago, I decided that breakfast foods were inappropriate for breakfast. And I, when I was eating breakfast, which I'm currently not doing per se, I started having a meal at breakfast and not just like an omelet, you know, a regular meal, salad, things of that nature. But most people, particularly where I am at, in Tennessee, where, you know, it's pancakes and donuts, that is just something you don't do. It's just something you don't do. But that's just a small transition towards where I think we've been long term. Um, so there's been uh, something in the idea that when we John, eat, Richard. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Um, as they say, the devil sometimes is in the detail. So when, when you use terminology like intermittent fasting, um, well, one, one concept that at least has worked for me, at least is that um, I, I've also eliminated breakfast, but from a different perspective. So I, I'm looking at it from a standpoint of two meals a day, but e eating in a window of time so that I'm not really eating anything uh, from seven o'clock till 12 noon. And so the time that I eat is, is condensed. And what is your, your opinion about that in regards to this question of intermittent fasting? Well, no, I think that's appropriate, but I think um, we're going to talk about this more next week. Um, we're going to get yeah. into the details of it. Like you said, the devil's in the detail. But the important thing is if you're hungry and you don't have a plan and discipline, then if, if you have a donut on a full stomach versus a donut on an intermittently fasted stomach, I think you're going to see significantly more insulin spiking in the latter case. So it, it, intermittent fasting is not about the time you don't eat. It's about the whole, the whole time period and, and your strategy around that. And the meal at the end of the intermittent fast is arguably more important than the fast itself. So the time domain doesn't really make much difference to me. It, it's really, you know, my wife has fasted for four days or people that have fasted for extraordinary number of days with some nutrient uh, infusions and have done well on it. But that, that's at least measuring at least, you know, restricted number of parameters. So that's my view on it. At, at the end of the day, if you're not eating well, it doesn't matter whether you're fasting or not. Um, and it's particularly when you're hungry to have a plan, not get into what Dr. Carter talked about in terms of the, the cravings and then responding to that. Whenever we respond, react rather than act proactively, it always creates problems. Yeah, that's the way I, that I generally fast. Um, I only have two meals a day, and more times than not, that first meal of the day is around 11 or 12, and that meal will probably be um, a, a shake, you know, like a protein shake with uh, kale and blueberries and coconut milk, something of that nature. And then, um, and then a meal, you know, for dinner. And that's more, that's the, that's kind of my routine for the most part. So it works out quite well. I, I've been adding a lot of, um, oils to my, uh, Hey Raymond, I've been adding a lot of oils to my shakes. So walnut oil, chia seeds, hemp seeds, hemp oil, avocado oil, um, black seed oil, things, things of that nature, just yeah, to get a, just to get variety. 
Absolutely. You know, one thing Dr. Carter and I were talking about that very few people appreciate is and when we're talking about neurodegenerative diseases is that our, our electrical system is a wire just like, you know, the, the thing you plug into the outlet. And there's sheathing. Uh, they're called Schwann cells. And a component of Schwann cell is a gamma linoleic acid. I would argue that, you know, we probably synthesize gamma linoleic acid. Matter of fact, I know we do from different fatty acids, but you can also get gamma linoleic acid um, from things like barrage oil or evening primrose oil. And there are other foods that have it, but those are the most concentrated. So just like with, you don't eat, you don't take in one probiotic, you know, you don't just eat one food, you go, you have diversity. And I think oils are underappreciated for their value in terms of having diversity there. Um, and they're also a little bit off talk, but topic, but they're very uh, satiating. So this is a, a book by Abigail Carroll on uh, the three squares, the invention of the American meal. And it's claimed that wild men like Raymond Harjo <laughs> would eat when they were hungry and the Europeans considered him uncivilized because he didn't have a regiment. And that's the whole thesis of this book that, you know, the quote, being civilized meant formal time for dining, irrespective of your caloric and nutritional needs. So anyway, probably a potentially very interesting book. But what I'm going to do now before I, I'm going to end with this video, um, which I'll play in a minute. But I just want to show you some other things, which may not seem a whole lot like intermittent fasting, but in some respects, Previous cultures did not eat as consistently. You know, 25 years ago, Europeans did, European vehicles did not have cup holders in their vehicles. You know, it was not part of the culture of the Europeans to constantly have a snack or a place to stat, have a soft drink or whatever in their car. It was, and then, of course, as the American market picked up, they had to appease the Americans and have oversized multiple cup holders front and back and the whole nine yards. And now the, uh, the automobile is a moving restaurant because God forbid we make it from, you know, noon to four without eating. So it, it really, we, we've gotten worse in this respect rather than better. But what, what does good eating and, and intermittent fasting do for health? There was a period of time back in 1870, plus or minus 10 years, where British people then lived longer than they do today. Lived longer than they do today, despite the fact that we talk about, oh, they only lived to 32. Well, the point is, when you exclude up to age five, anybody that survives to age five today or survived to age five back in 1870, then carry it forward, your potential to live longer was greater back in 1870. And so... What did they eat? A typical breakfast might consist of stone ground bread smeared with drippings of lard, accompanied by a large bunch of watercress rich in vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. So once again, nutrient density. There were plenty of cheap seasonal vegetables. They ate a lot of fiber-rich nuts, chestnuts and hazelnuts, which they roasted. Meat was relatively expensive, but you could buy sheep's head. There's the organ meat. And brain is the richest in cholesterol, and cholesterol is a repair and recovery molecule, very important. And they ate plenty of omega-3 rich oily fish, seafood, herring, sprats, eels, oysters, mussels, so on and so forth. And I think they missed the fact that what Paul Clayton talked about, because I, I spoke to the author several times about this. This was, this was an interpretation of his work, that they indeed ate the organ meat. They ate the entire, they grew chickens, they raised chickens, and they ate the entire chicken. And they wrote, they raised other fowl. So, um, and there's a reference to the article. Um, one more thing. Uh, it's really interesting that we're, we're focused on telomere length for longevity. But it turns out that Longevity, I, I, the reason why I bring this up is I'm going to show Cynthia Kenyon here in a second, if, if those of you who know her. Um, 
self-reported measures of health, mobility, um, cognitive function, exercise, inflammatory markers, and kidney function are more telling for longevity and healthy lifespan than telomere length is, potentially. Here's another case study of surviving well on very little food. So Laura Ingalls Wilder, the long winter. There was half a bushel of wheat and they could grind to make flour and there were a few potatoes, but nothing more to eat until the train came. And the train didn't come until end of April, early May. So they were surviving off their own body fat, minerals from the bones, things of that nature. So it's, it's, it's not a death sentence. The biggest problem with intermittent fasting, Richard, is the first two days or the first week. Um, and when you fast longer periods of time is really what I'm referring to. The first couple days, you, know, you can't do it if you're diabetic. You have to graduate into it. But if you're reasonably insulin sensitive, the first couple days you have hunger, but then after that, the hunger goes away for the most part. Not because you're dying, because you've adapted to ketosis and turning on the mechanisms to use existing stores of nutrients and calories. Um, I don't know why I'm picking on Cynthia Kenyon, but <clears throat> she is the kind of the guru of longevity in terms of looking at these roundworms and how they live so many times longer when you um, reduce the caloric intake. But see, the caloric intake without calories is never, without nutrients is never a good thing. Um, and the biggest, the biggest thing here is these, when you read these studies, what they're really talking about is achieving, achieving insulin sensitivity. It's achieving insulin sensitivity, not calorie restriction. It's affecting alternative pathways or primary pathways of uh, metabolism, other than just glucose sensitivity and insulin driven by insulin. And, you know, one of her goals uh, is to identify drugs that could turn on proteins that control these processes and delay aging and age-related diseases. That is not the way we want to go. All you want to do is you want to, the whole goal of intermittent fasting, of Atkins diet, of a ketogenic diet, is to be able to efficiently run in ketosis. So I'm vanilla as to what program it is, so that your insulin is absolutely optimized. Now, that being said, I thought it would be interesting to play this gentleman here that puts on these videos called um, uh, What I've Learned, extraordinarily good. I know many of you have heard me talk about that before and looked at his stuff, but it's about a 15-minute video, and then we'll take questions. Can I, can I say something real quick, Dr. Lewis? Sure, Raymond. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Raymond Harjo. I'm the founder of GoMD Virtual Health. Um, I just got my black belt in a martial arts that is centered around health. It's a healing. Congrats. Um, and I've been working at that for 12 years. Uh, just a couple of little notes. In my mind, the way I think about intermittent fasting is that, you know, you know, back in the day, people didn't have like a refrigerator, right? <laughs> so they'd have to go out and figure out what they're going to eat the rest of the day. And that's how they'd spend their morning energy. And also, it, it lets your body kind of finish what it started the day before, in my mind. Right. Um, one of the things we teach in my healing martial art, uh, I think I've touched with Dr. Lewis, is, and this is about nutrient absorption, is that you, you shouldn't drink fluids uh, a half hour to an hour before you eat and then a half hour to an hour after you eat. And what that does is it builds... Um, it, it builds your stomach, it builds your uh, digestive system um, so that it helps absorb more from what you put in. Most people eat, they're drinking something like a soda or even water, which dilutes um, the chemical reactions going on inside your digestive system and basically uh, negates a lot of the things that you can absorb. That's just one of the things we teach. And you can comment on that, Dr. Lewis, if you have any I'd let Dr. Carter comment on that because, um, you know, I think it, a lot of people drink before so they get the sensation of fall. And I, I, I think you're right. You need to produce 
acids and the enzymes and, you know, create, create the right environment. In chemistry, if you want a reaction to run, you increase the concentration of your reactants and it goes better. Right. So from a chemical perspective, Dr. Carter, anything? No, I mean, there's definitely a, a lot of, you know, validity in, in that. Um, most people don't do that, of course. Um, but uh, yes, definitely, ideally, during a meal, you really don't want to consume water because it will dilute the hydrochloric acid. Um, and for those who do have um, digestive uh, issues and absorption issues, yeah, that uh, certainly enhances that um, and makes it and makes it far worse. So yeah, I would agree with you, Raymond, on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I I do feel the difference, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and Raymond, you want to give your background because I made reference to you at the very beginning, sort of. <laughs> My background. Your your ethnic background. Your oh, I'm background. I'm Native American, um, mostly or half Native American and half um, European. So, um, got a lot of different genetics going on, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Good deal. But so I'm going to put this video on, and I think you'll find it interesting. Um, once again, it's about, fif about 15 minutes, 16 minutes. We need help. In the 1950s, my friend Bill was a very gifted engineer who made an extraordinary car. The car's main fuel source was electricity, and gasoline was to be put in whenever available. It was fine for the car to use gasoline every other day or so, but the problem was that people ran it on gasoline nearly 90% of the time. This resulted in the car breaking down frequently. All the while, Bill was trying to tell people, use it the way it was designed. Despite his advice, people continued to theorize about how to properly use the car. Bill went bankrupt and left the automotive industry soon after. The situation my poor imaginary friend Bill found himself in is quite like our modern health environment. How did eating get so complicated? Most of us just want to feel good, look good, and live a long life. You would think by now there would be a straightforward consensus on what our eating habits should look like. But we're faced with countless trains of thought on the topic. Maybe we're supposed to be doing the ABC diet or the XYZ diet or something in between. One of the first diets was proposed by a man named George Shane in 1724. Now on Amazon, you can find over 50,000 different books on the topic. Like Bill's car, surely there is a simple way we should be fueling our bodies that is most suitable for its design. Obviously, we're not engineered, but we Homo sapiens emerged around 200,000 years ago. And the majority of that time, the food environment could not have been anything like today's food environment. Agriculture didn't even exist for a good 190,000 years of that time. Not even the fruits and vegetables we have today would have been similar as we hadn't cultivated them to our liking. Just 700 years ago, here's what a banana would have looked like. So what way of eating did we adapt to? The environment would have chosen our diet rather than us. Your choices would have been to eat what was available or be dead. The idea that our body must have adapted to a certain ratio of macronutrients available in the environment is not novel and recently has become quite well known due to the paleo diet. However, what I'm getting at is our body would have also had to have adapted to how often the food was available. There should be a natural frequency of eating that promotes health and longevity. Where to start? The logic would be that more nourishment, more food, would make you healthier and live longer. But let's take a look at this from the first principles method as described by Elon Musk. It's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. So what do we know about longevity? Other than exercise, the word superfood might come to mind. Maybe more omega-3s or some red wine or making sure to take supplements and drink less alcohol will make us live longer. There are a lot of things that can contribute to longevity but there is one method accepted by science that you can use to consistently increase longevity. If I take any organism on the planet Earth, from yeast cells to spiders, insects, rabbits, dogs, and I reduce their caloric intake by 30%, they live 30% longer. The only organism which has not... I have to stop that because I proved that that is uh, incorrect. But uh, it, with caveats, it, it's largely correct. 
But when you take the American diet and you take someone who's pretty sick and then you calorie restrict that individual so that all they're doing is taking in less mm -hmm. of a lousy diet, they get sicker. And it's very obvious because there is some threshold of nutrients, essential nutrients, and things that support our liver to produce the other nutrients we need that we produce endogenously that we must have. So if you do this 30% reduction with garbage, then this result will not occur. Just Yet been deliberately tested by scientists are homo sapiens. Let's start here. For some time, the conventional wisdom has been that you need to get three balanced meals a day to stay healthy. Ever since I was a kid, breakfast, lunch, and dinner seemed as natural as sleeping or going to the bathroom. Breakfast was the most important meal of the day. I needed a healthy lunch to focus on the rest of the school day, and being sent to bed without dinner was child abuse. The situation is basically the same in Japan where I live now, as with the rest of the world. If we want to reduce caloric intake to increase lifespan, the only choice then is to eat less at each meal, because we need three meals, right? But where did this three meals a day idea come from? As Abigail Carroll suggests in her book, Three Squares, The Invention of the American Meal, eating three meals a day was basically invented due to culture. When European settlers got to America, they found Native Americans were basically just eating whenever they felt the urge to, rather than at specified times. The Europeans took their lack of defined eating times as evidence that they were uncivilized and had them change. In short, the three meals a day paradigm is not based off of our biological needs, how our environment designed us. In a hunter-gatherer culture, it wasn't surprising at all to feast on a big catch, then survive on very little or no food for an extended period of time until they were in need of another big source of fat and protein. In fact, the environment up until now would suggest that if we could not do that, we probably wouldn't be alive to be reading about dieting. The Piraha people, an indigenous hunter-gatherer group of the Amazon rainforest, was extensively studied by an anthropological linguist named Daniel Everett. He found they do not eat every day or even attempt to do so. They were even aware of food storage techniques, yet never used them except to barter with Brazilian traders. When questioned about why they do not store food for themselves, they explained, I store meat in the belly of my brother. Until the advent of agriculture, eating three meals a day and in some cases even eating every day was a near impossibility. Some of you may be pointing to the fact that the life expectancy in the Paleolithic era was much lower than now at around 33 years as a sign that our modern eating habits are healthier. However, infant mortality rate was a big factor in bringing that number down. You have to understand that one of the effects of modern civilization and technology is that you can be unresourceful or made up of weak genetic material and not die. As Doug McGuff explains about the life expectancy back then, it didn't really have anything to do with anabolic catabolic balance or long-term health benefits because there were older survivors and the fossil evidence of those older survivors based on ligamentous attachments and bony assessment and bone mineral density was they were extraordinarily robust. Glucose metabolism and how conventional wisdom screwed us. The common misconception is that a stable blood glucose is necessary for survival which would biologically justify three meals a day. Bear with me through a bit of biochemistry to understand why constantly consuming carbohydrates to maintain blood glucose is not only unnecessary, but can be a detrimental and vicious cycle. So after you eat some carbohydrates, bread, pasta, candy, whatever, glucose enters the bloodstream and insulin is secreted to distribute the glucose properly. Via an insulin receptor, glucose enters the cells to produce energy. This can only happen at a certain rate. So to avoid overloading the cell with glucose or having glucose sit in the bloodstream, 70 grams can be stored in the liver and 200 grams in the muscle. So you have your morning bagel and some frappe. Whatever you want, some vanilla bullshit, latte, kappa thing, you know, whatever you got, I don't care. And you've stored all the glucose you can store. So it has to go into your body fat. As well as storing it as energy, your body puts it in your body fat because the fat cells have less complex machinery as the other cells. Too much glucose can bind to proteins and muck up the machinery of the cells in a harmful inflammatory process called glycation. It's kind of like pouring pancake syrup into a car engine. The problem here is that if your energy levels start to wane, 
you can't tap the energy out of your stored body fat and because the hormone that does that, hormone-sensitive lipase, is sensitive to insulin. Insulin will not allow you to tap body fat for energy. If you have a bunch of insulin sitting in your blood from processing a bunch of glucose before and you need energy, you're going to get ravenously hungry and you'll need to jack your blood sugar up short term with a snack or something to raise your energy levels again. This is why if you're following the recommended American diet, you're usually going to be stuck in this loop of wanting to eat every time your blood glucose drops and three meals a day will feel very necessary. Even medical doctor Peter Atia fell victim to this. Uh, despite exercising three or four hours every single day and following the food pyramid to the letter, I gained a lot of weight and developed something called metabolic syndrome. Ketosis to the rescue. If you stop eating glucose for about 10 to 12 hours, your glucose stores will deplete and your body will start breaking down fat so that the liver can produce something called ketone bodies. Ketone bodies produce energy for your cells through similar pathways as glucose, but are much more stable, efficient, and don't cause complications like we just talked about. You may have heard of this ketosis state referred to as starvation mode in school, but this by no means suggests that you are about to starve. I particularly dislike this term because it suggests that glucose, carbohydrates, is our body's primary fuel source, when in fact it is possible to live entirely without carbohydrates. Humans have absolutely no requirement for carbohydrate. Not one gram do we require. We have this fabulous liver that produces as much glucose as you require. Case in point, a 456-pound, 27-year-old man in Scotland fasted for an incredible 382 days, consuming only water and vitamin supplements. He lost 276 pounds and completed the fast with no ill effects. He was technically in starvation mode this entire time, and his body was using his stored body fat for energy. Quick note, ketosis and diabetic ketoacidosis are not the same thing. Several years back, when I first heard about low-carb diets, I was skeptical, and frankly, when I heard that my close friend's mother was trying the Atkins diet, I was worried for her. However, after understanding the biochemistry behind it, I started doing the paleo diet. I felt great in general, had a better physique with less effort, and much more stable energy levels. The downside was it got kind of annoying to have to plan my meals so much, so I would cheat a lot here and there. The Benefits of Fasting even after people were in environments where they could eat much more frequently, the concept of fasting for health benefits has been around for quite some time. An Egyptian pyramid inscription from around 3800 BC reads, humans live on one quarter of what they eat. On the other three quarters lives their doctor. Plato apparently fasted for greater mental efficiency. The Luther of medicine, Philippus Paracelsus, called fasting the greatest remedy and Mark Twain suggested fasting to be more effective than any medicine. The Romans even found that they could cure people who were possessed with demons by shutting them in a room without food. To simplify an incredibly complex process, aging in essence is the result of cumulative damage to your DNA. Professor of genetics David Sinclair and his team found that not eating stimulates proteins called the sirtuins. These are responsible for DNA repair and have been identified as a key factor in longevity. Professor of neuroscience Mark Matson at John Hopkins University showed how fasting promotes the growth of new neurons in the brain. This explains why fasting is linked to the prevention of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. This information got me excited about intermittent fasting. With intermittent fasting, you're not eating for 16 hours of the day, which gives your body time to deplete the glucose stores and start burning fat as well as reap the benefits discussed above. There was a time oh, when hospitality stirred nobler tendencies. They don't eat Gen one day, I can tell you that's for sure. So many know. sources are pointing to the key here being that whether you are doing extended fasting, intermittent fasting, or simply eating less, you are giving your body a chance to deplete its glucose stores and dip into ketosis, leading to the health benefits we discussed. I was keen on the fact that I could get similar effects to paleo with more leeway in my diet. The problem with intermittent fasting was I found myself craving food outside of the eight-hour period, and I still had to be somewhat strict with what I ate, although of course not as strict as my three meals a day regimen. Upton Sinclair, who was born in the late 1800s and lived to the swell age of 90, published a book in 1911 called The Fasting Cure, 
The book was inspired by the personal accounts of 250 people who cured some ailment with extended fasting. The ailments range from colds, headaches, constipation to arthritis, valvular heart disease, and cancer. Dr. Alan Goldhammer spoke about how in 2012, a 42-year-old patient cured her cancer, stage 3 follicular lymphoma, with a 21-day fast. All this opened me up to try my first week-long fast, but I ended up quitting around the fourth day, even though I didn't feel particularly bad. While I missed my goal and I didn't really feel all that different afterward, over the next following days, I started to notice something. I used to enjoy eating some refined sugar crap here and there, but after the fast, I wasn't so interested. It was like it reset my eating preferences. Around this time, I came across a book called Kufuku Ahito Kenko Ni Suru by Dr. Yoshinori Nagumo. The title means hunger makes people healthy, and it provides an incredibly compelling argument for limiting yourself to one meal per day. It touched upon many of the things I've talked about here, some things I didn't, and it dispelled some worries I had like malnutrition. Also, it was easy to trust him since he's 30 years older than me and looks younger than I do. I decided to try eating once per day for two weeks. For three weeks prior to starting, I had been showing my little sister around Tokyo while eating basically anything and everything that looked good. I started the Nagumo plan the day after she left, and the first three days were definitely the hardest. When the clock hit around 11 a.m., I realized I wasn't getting the joy from eating that I was used to around this time of day and started really wanting to eat. My stomach didn't particularly hurt. It was the equivalent of not being able to play video games when getting home from middle school. Around 4 p.m. was when I was convinced that I was really hungry and needed to eat. Waiting another 30 minutes until 4.30 p.m. to eat was like pushing through a last set of squats. The next two days were slightly easier, and come the fourth day, I realized I wasn't looking at the clock thinking, uh, only four more hours to go. A week later, I decided to put the diet to the test by doing a 50-kilometer bike ride to Atsugi from Tokyo. I hadn't been working out all that much, and the usual bike ride for me was about three kilometers. It was, unsurprisingly, difficult, but I never felt really physically weak. I had hunger pangs earlier than normal, but I didn't feel like I had less strength from a lack of food. This made me decide to stick with eating once per day. It's been a month since I started and I feel great in general. My energy levels are very stable. I feel more focused and surprisingly, I have less problems with hunger compared to intermittent fasting. Even if I don't eat the healthiest meal, I can now feel confident that my body will have more than enough time to empty out whatever excess glucose or toxins I ingested. The only time I do crave unhealthy food is when I've had some alcohol. Looking back, it's hard to imagine having to pile so much food into my stomach throughout the day. Other than the health benefits, one other reason I do this is the same reason Steve Jobs wore basically the same thing every day. It makes choosing easier, and it frees my brain up to focus on other things. At least for myself, the amount of new information I get only changes my behavior by a small factor. For example, if I increase my knowledge about the detriments of alcohol by, say, 60%, maybe I'll cut my intake by 30%. With this article alone, I'm not expecting you to suddenly start eating once per day, but hopefully you can start giving your body a break and eat when you need to, not when the clock says you should. Okay. Once again, a little more of a historical perspective on it and some different insights. But uh, next time we'll talk about sort of more granular and some health guides to intermittent fasting. I think everybody should be doing it. I think, uh, you know, work your way up to it, maybe doing it once a week and then increasing it to a, a greater frequency. Of course, he's doing it one meal a day, every day, and he's not calling it intermittent fasting, but it really is. But anyway, anybody have any questions or comments? Dr. Carter, do you want to comment on any of the content there before I take questions? I mean, that was, that was pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, you know, the, the real benefits come from what is called autophagy, you know, so it's, you know, when you're giving your body that break, it's actually getting rid of damaged cells um, so that the renewal process can uh, occur more efficiently. So, yes, the benefits of intermittent fasting are, are quite vast. So, and I agree with you, everyone should really be doing that. And maybe uh, next week when we go into a more organically, you can recommend supplements you would take to augment that autophagy process. Mm -hmm. 
we can do that next time. Yeah. That being the case, anybody have any so, questions about today? So Tom, Tom, just just a comment um, in regards to this. Mm -hmm. I, I think what's happened is we've automated eating. Um, I don't think people literally, in some cases, and I can't. I can only speak for myself because intermittent fasting has taught me that the reality is food tastes better and you enjoy eating better when you don't have to do it based on it's simply a schedule that means you have to have breakfast and you have to have lunch and you have to have dinner at specific times. Right. To some degree, we probably even have lost the, uh, the, the taste of eating because of the way it's become automated. You know, That's just a perception. It's an interesting point, and Richard, uh, Dr. Carter and I are working with a couple of groups with underprivileged individuals, and uh, guess what? Intermittent fasting costs less. You know, skip two meals a day, and what happens to your food budget? Absolutely. Well, the advantage is it's healthier. Yeah. yeah. I, I have one comment, though. Let's say you are um, very overweight, so you, you've been eating very toxic, nasty food, which I... I mean, your, your fat stores toxins, is that right? Because mm -hmm. I think about this because, you know, as a mother, when you're, when you're um, going to nurse, I, I look at mothers who are really overweight because you don't want the toxins to be the food for your baby. So if you're working off your fat stores, that could be what you're using. But so my, I guess what I'm saying is if you're really overweight and then you start to fast, so now you have these toxins coming out, what, how do you address that? So, yeah, I mean, you definitely mobilize those toxins, you know, more when you are doing an intermittent fast. So you really, again, when someone is morbidly obese, making sure the detoxification pathways are open. So making sure the person is not constipated, which, you know, a vast majority of America is. Um, so you really should be having two or three bowel movements per day, um, making sure, you know, um, uh, from, you know, urinating well and your kidney function is good, liver function is optimized. Of course, a lot of us have, um, are on the pathway of having fatty liver, which is very, very common these days, especially with the, you know, the, the carbohydrate load that we are uh, eating. But fatty liver also contributes to um, liver dysfunction. So, and liver is the body's main detoxification organ. So, so from what you're saying, yes, that, that is a concern because those things get mobilized. So you want to optimize all those organs, use of uh, supplements like N-acetylcysteine, and milk thistle, uh, so forth that help the liver, glutathione, which is the body's master antioxidant. Um, you know, those are some of the things that can help bind the toxins once they become mobilized. The other thing too is I think you have to be really careful about, we're not recommending intermittent fasting because someone has an insulin level, fast, uh, fasting insulin level of 50. You know, you gotta, you gotta get to a certain point. Um, for your fasting insulin level before, you know, the pain of uh, fasting is not going to be too great. Right. You're not going to be successful. So there are going to be pre-treatment strategies for someone with a very, very high fasting insulin as a surrogate A1C or glucose, but really the number is the fasting insulin uh, to be able to do that. So I think you probably want to be 10 or below to start intermittent fasting. And before that, you're going to do things like increasing healthy fats and reducing total carbohydrate intake and slowly bring that, uh, that fasting insulin level down. One more quick one, too, because I'm on the other end where I don't want to lose weight. And I have tried so many different diets. And I eat 100% organic, so I'm, I'm eating healthy food. But I, don't, I have malabsorption problems. But... I find that if I don't have some carbohydrates in my diet, like I eat a lot of brown rice, I can literally drop two pounds, two, three pounds in a day, and it's a lot on me. So if I have like a week where, say I, I was doing like a, a paleo type diet where I'm just eating meat and vegetables, sometimes I literally just can't get enough. Um, I, it, I feel like I lose weight more quickly that way. 
So again, but you're, you're mal, you, you have some malabsorption issues. So but no, yeah. which no one can figure out, and I've been to every type of doctor you can imagine. Well, it, it, uh, again, it, we we need to uh, have a consult. <laughs> yeah. No, I recently, you know what? I recently just put on ten pounds, okay. and I, my weight stays stable usually unless I have like something major going on. But um, I, I I can't figure out why, but it did. Just uh, not changing anything, but there you have it. Anyway, it's always different. But I, I just, I, I, find, I always feel like I need a little bit of something. I don't like a more of a mixed diet, but that's just the way I feel. But maybe I haven't done a really good um, ketogenic diet and done it right. I don't know. Well, I mean, again, with the ketogenic diet, I mean, you really don't want to be on that long term. Uh, it, there's a difference between ketogenic and intermittent fasting. So, yeah, intermittent fasting is uh, just eating less often. You know, being in ketosis is a, a different element to that. So, um, and with the craze of ketogenic diets, it, there, there comes a point where the body, um, it is not a positive thing to be on a long-term ketogenic diet. As a matter of fact, you know, I've, I have a couple of patients that have been on ketogenic diets for a year and a half, and they are actually now becoming insulin resistant. So they are on their way to having diabetic issues. Um, you know, again, you, you, there are some nuances in there. You can't just eat meat all the time because high protein also, you know, degrades to, you know, uh, sugar and, and, and can cause insulin resistance. Sure. One quick question. Um, so I, I do intermittent fasting uh, from dinner. I try to eat by seven. Mm -hmm. um, and then my first meal of the day is noon. Uh -huh. I'm always eating during this because by then I am ready to eat. Right. But right. one thing I do do, I drink black coffee. Mm. So I feel like that's, that's my go-to thing. You know, I keep myself busy like all morning long. I drink black coffee. I, I uh, have a little monk fruit as a sweetener. Mm -hmm. That, does that matter? Is that? Well, again, I mean, uh, coffee is, it's a plus or minus. So, you know, if you are experiencing fatigue and uh, mm -hmm. at, at points, you know, coffee definitely affects the adrenal glands. Um, so in a lot of instances, it can be problematic. Also, if, um, you are gluten sensitive, the vast majority of coffee, um, actually has a gluten like, um, effect on the body. Yeah. Uh, a lot of coffee actually has mold. So, so again, you, you have to kind of put it into context you know, with kind of what's going on. But in general, yes, coffee, because of the polyphenols and all of that, it does have positive attributes for a good number of people. Um, but yeah, so gotta, gotta look a, a bit deeper into kind of what's going on. So in your, in, your, in your case, because your insulin is so good, I would just be testing for ketone bodies and see if they're actually in ketosis because that's what ultimately we want to do we want to be able to mm -hmm. have both mechanisms working efficiently we want to have low we want to have insulin sensitivity and we want to have uh, the ability to burn fat easily and well and so the ketone bodies really is the answer to your question not not what you're eating how you're eating when you're eating what you're adding to it, the monk fruit, throwing it in. You know, in my opinion, you know, the monk fruit is kind of like spoiling your opportunity to train the body to eat the, um, to, to consume the fats could be wrong. But your ketone body test along with the insulin test would be the answer to that. Yeah. The little ketone meter thing, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. You know, that they're available because of diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, but so you can get your ketone test the urine and just see, you know, is it white, pink, purple, whatever, and you get an idea of how, much, how many ketone bodies you have. 
And I'm not sure how you're supposed to use those. I've never done that. Do you, Dr. Carter, do you do that fasting? When do you, when do, you do the ketone body testing? Yeah, you do, you do a fasting, yeah. And you want to be somewhere between 0.5 and 4.5, you know, in terms of ketosis. And that's kind of, you know, kind of the sweet spot range for that, you know. Yep. When you wake, when you wake up in the morning, good time to do it? Yeah, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be insulin sensitive, but you can still be not really um, efficient at burning fat just because you you're keeping your calories low, you're keeping your carbs low, but you you met your energy demands, and it's it's the lowest energy. I mean, it's the easiest to convert energy to carbohydrate. So you know, at least in our culture, because you've trained, we've been trained that way in our culture. So you know, you can have a good insulin, but not be burning ketones, which is where I think you want to. When when they talk about longevity and health. You want to be low insulin, low insulin with some efficiency of burning ketones. That's, mm-hmm. that's probably the best description of uh, the markers that that meet all these fasting endpoints physiologically. Thank you. Any other questions? Killed another valuable hour of your day. <laughs> Thank you very, Thank you. very much. Thanks, Dr. Carter. All right. Thanks, Dr. Good work. Bye now. All right. Very good. Thank you very Thanks. much.